Hi, I'm Sarah Constantino. Um, I'll be teaching the social analysis part of the lectures. Hi, I'm Rob Nixon. I'm uh, going to be teaching the literature and the arts section. Okay. Yeah. <laughs>
Top left. So, yep.
Yes. <laughs> okay, so I'll, I'll try not to speak too loudly, but please let me know if you can't hear me. Um, so I'll be lecturing on the policy and behavioral dimensions of the nexus, that you'll see these topics come up in many of the other lectures as well. Um, so we're in a moment of historical disruption in society and in the environment from the ongoing pandemic to the transfer of power during the 2020 federal elections to recent ongoing wildfires and temperature records worldwide. And so this might be an opportune moment to redirect policy and reshape uh, associated narratives. But to do, the, to do this, we need to know the dominant paradigms and drivers of individual and collective behaviors, beliefs, and values. In my lectures, I'll introduce some of the paradigms used by social scientists to capture the social, political, and economic features of environmental dilemmas that make them particularly challenging collective action problems. I'll discuss different ways to think about the social and economic costs and benefits of both unmitigated climate change and of environmental policies and the social and political barriers and pathways to implementing these policies. Next slide, please. Okay. So broadly, my lectures will cover why the market economy, while powerful in many respects, is not well equipped to deal with the kinds of problems we're confronting in the nexus. The cartoon to the right is an illustration of the tragedy of the commons, a theory that describes the tendency for people to overexploit commonly owned resources, in part because they neglect social outcomes in favor of personal gains. At the local scale, these types of problems might be resolved through informal institutions and governance, but on the global scale, regulation cooperation by formal institutions and governments is necessary. So we'll also look at the role of political institutions and growing partisan gaps in exacerbating the challenges of the nexus. Next slide, please. Thanks. Um, and, okay, so economic paradigms, the ones that I'll introduce in the first couple lectures can be a useful framework for understanding many environmental and social dilemmas, but they also make particular assumptions about human nature and behavior that often depart substantially from real world behaviors and policy responses. And understanding these responses is crucial for overcoming political gridlock around policies, um, many policies favored by economists like carbon taxes. So the image on the right is of the Yellow Vests movement, a po populist movement that started in France in 2018 in response to rising fuel prices meant to curb reliance on fossil fuels. So this movement highlights the need to consider the social and distributive impacts of climate policies and how the public will support or oppose these policies. And then finally, I'll discuss recent work looking at how social norms influence behavior and how prevailing norms and narratives change over time. So many existing norms, for example, dietary choices or reliance on fossil fuels are unsustainable. And recently there's been a lot of research focused on understanding the dynamics through which these cultural values change and how social movements emerge. And so we'll discuss these processes in more detail. Thank you. Now I'll pass it over to Rob. Great, so thank you, uh, Sarah and Steve. Uh, so we'll be looking really at the realm of the imagination in uh, this, this section of the course. Um, we need data to understand how we can get to a better future, a more viable future for us and other species um, by 2050. But we also need imagination. We're asking you to leap ahead to 2050 and imagine yourselves as perhaps grandparents, different phase of life in a completely different world. And so... We have so many um, different cultural perspectives on what kinds of worlds have been historically and what kinds of worlds we can help generate. And storytelling, memes, images are vital spurs because they can help us uh, translate data into emotions. And emotions are a vital element in any uh, movement for social change. So this is, I think is a critical component in trying to think kind of intersectionally about the relationship between science, data, social policy, and the creativity that the arts bring. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, so, so basically we're looking at the relationship between the material world and the imaginative realm. We're also looking uh, with these four crises at what is the role of creativity? And that creativity um, involves clearly uh, domains like engineering, but it also demands that we keep open the channels of imagination and that we rethink 
what constitutes normality. So any crisis, whether it's a COVID crisis, uh, whether it's the climate crisis, um, generates new sets of possibilities and spurs people to rethink the acceptability of normal practices. And the arts can play a vital role in that. Uh, and so one of the, one of the factors that is, is challenging in uh, thinking through these big crises is the question of scale. The temporal scales, we, sometimes with the Anthropocene, we're thinking in terms of many thousands of years, but even getting to 2050 can be a stretch for us in terms of our ability to feel that space. And at the same time, um, geographically, uh, it's hard to think in planetary terms. So how can we generate feelings for an alternative uh, planet, in a sense, uh, an alternative way of existing the planet through words, through images, and through stories. Uh, next slide, please. So I just wanted to ground this in a specific image. Uh, we all know this phrase, I can't breathe. When it was um, generated, nobody dreamt that it would go global, that it would have the power that it has. This image is a photograph that a friend of mine took uh, in Cape Town, South Africa. And it's on a wall um, uh, concealing a shanty town, uh, an informal settlement from the, the main highway that leads from the airport to the scenic city of Cape Town. So it was built because uh, the authorities didn't want the, the so-called blight of the informal settlement to be seen uh, by the tourists coming into Cape Town. But um, this informal settlement uh, is subject to discriminatory uh, zoning laws. There's a big coal-fired plant uh, just half a mile away. Uh, there's also the fumes from the motorway. So physiologically, uh, these, uh, these communities are suffering environmental discrimination and it affects their lungs. They can feel it each with each breath. But also, like um, so many poor communities around the world, they're uh, subject to brutal and unregulated policing. Uh, and so you can see the convergence of infrastructural questions, questions of class discrimination and racism, and also the, the, the sheer physiolo physiological trauma of struggling to breathe. Um, so I'll be talking about the role of the symbolic next week with a focus on how do we translate and communicate imaginatively uh, the, the melting of uh, the Arctic ice. Thank you.